Good evening. My name is Silver Underworld, and welcome to my channel called Silver Slumbers. I'm going to help you get those soothing Z's that you deserve. If you are enjoying what you are hearing, down below in the description box, if you would like to buy me a coffee, it would be really appreciated as it does help me in the channel out. I thank you in advance. In today's video, I'm going to read true scary stories. So sit back, relax, and close those eyes. But be careful. Don't get lost in the dark. Warning. Some of these stories contain graphic content, such as suicide, gun violence, and death. Viewer's discretion is advised. I'm a police officer in the southern west USA in a suburban department of about 100 sworn officers. I work in a college town. I've been about 10 years now, made sergeant four years ago, but at the time of the story, I was just two years on working night shift patrol. I've been lucky that not a lot has affected me, mentally anyway. I don't have kids. That's how it gets to usually. You can build all the mental walls you want, but when you have an emotional connection to your kids and see something happening to the kids, well, the wall just means nothing. Anyway, this one stuck with me. Still makes my hair stand on end, especially when it rains. It was September, just after midnight. I could put on a call of shots fired. Now, normally these calls turn out to be either fireworks or perhaps a car backfiring, but mostly fireworks. So unless we get multiple calls on it, or a confirmed gunman, or someone confirmed wounded, we just send one unit. That night, it was me. The shots fired was reported around a college football stadium. This was during football season, so there were a bunch of really big white tents set up everywhere, the parking lots, for tailgaters. I notified dispatch that I was on scene, and started rolling through the parking lots, casting my spotlight here and there. It was raining. Pretty. Heavily. And hard to see. About halfway through the lots, my spotlight illuminated a silhouette of a man sitting on a folding chair under one of those big tents. I pulled closer and lit him up and notified dispatch that I was out here with one in the parking lot. His back was to me. He appeared to be hunched forward as if his elbows were on his knees and his head leaned forward. I walked towards him and start calling him out. Can't remember exactly what I said, but something like, Hey man, you okay? You heard anything strange? Can you talk to me? He didn't move or answer. As I drew closer, I lit him up with my flashlight. I didn't notice an outline of a shotgun on the pavement next to him. Combined with him not answering and the nature of the call, it was enough for me to break leather and have dispatch hold the channel. I kept calling him as I approached, asking him to show his hands, etc. 30 feet, 20 feet, 10 feet. My handgun, Glock Model 22, as a streamlight, TLR1 light on it. So I had him lit up, 6 feet, under the tent with him. Five feet. Four feet. I close in on him. Come around to the front of him. Shotgun suicides are difficult. Often if they put the barrel under their chin, the blast from the barrel will blow the gun out from under the chin before the shot ever hits them. This guy succeeded. His elbows were indeed resting on his knees. It was as if though he blew his head off, set the shotgun next to him and then leaned forward and rests his elbows on his knees to think about what he has done. About that time, I noticed that. Even though I was under the tent with them, it felt like it was still raining. And then I looked up. So this story happened about 11 years ago. I was a senior in high school at the time. 
but it is the most mind-boggling thing I have ever experienced. It is also important to note that it happened in mid-December. I am from Iowa. You know, winters here get cold at night. Like, if you get stuck outside, you will die of cold. That plus a snowfall makes everything dead silent. You can hear anything. And everything inside the house and even immediately outside of it. Well, me and my best friend were hanging out in my family's walkout basement. Just having a boring winter night playing some video games. We were also the only ones home. The reason it was just us because my mother went from straight to work to straight to the bar to grab a few drinks with co-workers. And my friend and I thought it'd be a good idea to bring into the family wine cellar and live a little. As we were sitting there opening the first bottle, I hear the door to the garage open and slam shut. I immediately go, oh man, and start looking for a place to hide the bottle. My friend then says, dude, I thought you said your mom was supposed to be out like all night. She was, I replied. I then heard a few heavy stomps and heard my mother yell out. Meow Zaboo? Meow Zaboo? Anyone home? I yelled back up the stairs. Yeah, just hanging out in the basement. I hear a few more steps move from the garage door towards the stairs and she yelled it again. Can you come help me with something? I need you back up here. I replied back while frantically trying to find a good place to hide the wine bottle. Y yeah, just, just give me a minute. Then there was silence for about 20 seconds. Anyone down there with you? She yelled back in a more concerned and serious tone. In a voice that was slightly off my mother's. This was the first thing that told me that something wasn't right. Our family never cared if anyone was over, as our house was a very open house to families and friends. And the voice, it was just wrong. Like, it sounded like my mother's, but it was missing something that I just couldn't put my finger on. Weirded out, I replied back, uh, just Colton. After I yelled that back to her, I found a good place to hide the bottle and began walking up the stairs to the next level. Now, as I was walking up the stairs, I couldn't help but feel the overbearing silence of the house and the slight electric twing that something isn't right. When I got to the top of the stairs, I look over to where the garage door is and also the kitchen right next to it. And it's pitch black. Just darkness. All if the lights were off and there was no moonlight shining through any windows. I walked over to the kitchen yelling out. Mom, where are you? There was no reply. Just silence and darkness. I feel the electric twing turn into full needles. And my adrenaline kicking into full force. I have to get out of here as fast as possible. My mother was not home. I run back down the stairs, grabbing my coat along the way. What's wrong? Colton says. My mom's not home. I replied as fast as I can, looking for my truck keys. What do you mean? You were just talking to her. I could see the confusion in his face. There's no one home. We need to leave now. I took a few steps forward to the back door that opens up to my yard, and then I see my dog shaking on the couch and my cat growling behind it. I couldn't leave them. I just knew that if we left, something would happen. Are we leaving? Colton said, still confused as hell. No, I, I just can't leave them here. Something's really off. I'm going to call my mom and figure this out. I pull out my phone and call my mom. She picks up immediately. Meows in bro, what's going on? She answers. 
Mom, were you just home? I heard yelling for me for a second. I heard yelling for me from the second floor. And when I got up there, you weren't there. I said frantically, hoping that she was playing a joke. No, I'm just leaving the bar. I wasn't feeling very well. Are you okay? What do you mean you heard me? I filled her in one whole story, and she rushes home. Colt and I stay in the basement with the animals until she got home. But before she did, you could hear something upstairs. Not walking or sitting on things, but a pressure in the air. Like a black hole was slowly moving from one room to the next. And the word that I would describe was that it was hungry. When she got home, you could feel the thing leave just as quickly as it came in. Like an overbearing predatory presence had just flown away. We still have never figured out what the hell was going on. And this is just one story of many unexplainable things that have happened to us. But this is the easiest to write down. And one that I was happy to have to witness. My mother has passed away now. And I moved away to Arizona. But whenever I go back to Iowa and I see Colton, he still gets creeped out by what happened. I will never truly know what happened, but I know whatever it was that had my mother's voice, it was evil and it was hungry. This is probably the creepiest and most unexplainable thing that has ever happened to me. I used to work overnight as a security guard at a local port. Usually none of the port's workers would stay overnight, except for the safety official. I would be on the shift alone since the site has a radius of nearly two miles. Overnight, usually there would be three guards including me. Since the area was fairly big, there were different posts, but front gate was the main entrance area where all the guards would be stationed overnight since there was no need to put them in other posts due to the fact that there was no activity in the site at this time. The veteran guards that had been there for years would often say that this site was haunted given the fact that there has been accidents and deaths that had occurred in the area a long time ago. I was aware that people died here due to freak accidents and I do believe in angels and demons since I am a religious person. But I always thought that the superiors were just messing with the new guys. I would work five to six nights of the week. And for the first few weeks, I never really saw or heard anything out of the ordinary. Except for maybe a few questionable creaks. And would see a few misplaced objects while doing my patrol rounds. But nothing too crazy. Just to describe the setting for you, this is a fairly big site on occasions when there is a big project being constructed at the port. The workers would sometimes stay overnight due to the fact that there were many times the port workers were required to stay at the port for a few days. There's a gym in the site for their convenience. This gym is fairly old. In the gym, there's a sauna, weights, and even a racquetball court. If you don't know what a racquetball court is, it's similar to an indoor tennis court with thin plastic walls and thick glass doors. Usually on our patrol rounds, me and one of the other guards, Mike, would stop by the gym and play a few rounds of racquetball before returning back to the front gate. On one of those nights, me and Mike decided to hit a full workout session instead of playing racquetballs in the cage. This is around 2.30 in the morning and the entire building is so quiet that you can hear the electricity run through the lights. The air conditioner is off, and so is everything else. The only thing that's running are the lights. 15 to 20 minutes into the workout, we hear a loud thump. We cross it off as nothing and continue working out. And after a few more minutes, we heard a loud thump once more. At first, we thought it was our lieutenant, which could have been walking around. But when we radioed him, he gave us his location, which was front gate. We tried to think logically on what could be making those thumb noise on the wall. 
They were coming from the court on the other side. We thought it was the air conditioner, but then remembered that it was off, and even when the switch is on during the day, there's no reports of thumbs coming from the air conditioner. After a few more minutes, the thumbs continued occurring right after another. We were very creeped out at this point, but what we were about to witness still scares the absolute crap out of us to this day. We start to approach to the other side of the gym where the glass door was. We turn on the flashlight and aimed it towards the clear glass door. And I got chills all over my body when I started tearing so much out of fear that I was about to cry. We saw one of the balls rolling slowly by itself inside the court, but there was no one in there. So that means the loud thumbs were the balls mysteriously being tossed against the wall as if someone or something was playing inside the cage. We were both so confused and frightened at how this was happening. We couldn't make sense of any of it. We were so, so scared. And we started yelling and running away. Because we knew that there was probably something evil toying with us there. As we full sprinted back to the front gate, the lieutenant saw us and asked us why we were tearing up and why we were running in a ridiculous manner. We told him what we witnessed and his facial expressions scared us even more. He said, that's why there's always guards that quit often. There's something evil in the area. And it's not the first time that something that bad happened here. He even showed us security footage of dark figures and shadows literally passing through the office areas and lights mysteriously switching on and off. To this day, I still get chills recounting my experience with my friends and family. And I'm even getting chills right now as I'm typing this. I had never had a real encounter with anything supernatural until that night. Many say that it was a demonic presence messing around. Others say it was a ghost of a dead person who died in the area. I don't know what it was, but I didn't last long in that job after that. There were other experiences, but I'll send those at a later time. This is my first ever post, and it's a true story. I was living in a rural area of Oklahoma with my mother at a small lake house. And I'm probably 10, 11 at this time. One night, I'm asleep in my room when I randomly and abruptly woke up for no reason. This was not normal for me, and I felt very uneasy. The only sound I could hear was my mother snoring in the next room on the couch. I rolled over and tried to go back to sleep, but my needs to use the restroom was growing more urgently. So I grudgingly forced myself to head that way. The bathroom was on the other side of the house, around a corner and past the kitchen, and finally down a long hallway on the right. So after I made the trip and finished my business, I flipped off the light switch and started heading back to my bed. That's when I heard a distinct clicking noise of a light switch, and I saw the glow of the bathroom light in the hallway. Terrified, I slowly turned around just to witness the light in the bathroom start clicking and on and off. Click, 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 click. Finally, it shut off completely. In the dark of the hallway, my eyes began to make out a white shape near the end of the hallway. It was around my size and crouched on the floor. At this point, I'm frozen to the spot as my minds begin to realize that no one else is home except for me and my mom. Then the white shape began whispering in a quiet man's voice. Help me. I'm lost. I remember wanting to scream for my mom, but I couldn't. And instead, I barely said, No. 
before this thing starts running at me on what sounds like all fours, I quickly ran through the kitchen and around the corner before running to my sleeping mother, shaking her awake. I remember saying, it's coming, it's coming. My mother's eyes going from dazed to alert in an instant. She asked me on what's going on. I saw her eyes look over to my shoulder before she screamed. Remembering her scream still makes my blood run cold. Never have I had experience of pure terror like that in my life. Even to this day. She grabs my arm, my pull in the arm, and pulls me into my room and slams the door. She holds me in her arms with her back pressing against the door. As we listen, it sounded like the thing was running around in circles in the kitchen. We could hear hands and feet slapping against the tile. The kitchen had a sliding glass door to the outside, which sounded like it was open, then slammed. We sat there horrified until daybreak. I was sent to my grandmother's to the next town for a while after that, never set foot to the house again. Years later, my mom said that she was walking around the property after the incident and came across a small burial site with three headstones that which belonged to a child from the early 1900s. It freaks me out because what I heard that night was a man's voice, but it was so unnatural. My mom still will not tell me what she saw behind me and what it was that made her scream. She tells me she's afraid that if she talks about it, it will come back. This is the first of many things that have happened to me in my life, and I'm still scared. I'm a graffiti artist. Before you judge me and say I'm a bad person or whatever, hear me out. I work on pieces in my city, Birmingham and United Kingdom. This happened a few weeks back in the east side of the city. There's a canal that runs through the city, which is naturally filled with tags and graffiti pieces, as it's a pretty quiet spot, but certain parts of it are visible to the public. It isn't easy to get down to the canal, but me and my friends, who also is into graffiti art, stumble across a hidden ladder in a run-down car park on the back streets of the east side. We climb down and realize we can walk the whole length of the canals. The water was pretty high up on this day, so we had to be careful. After about 30 minutes, we had painted over old, ruined pieces of graffiti, created new tags, and just generally had a good time. That's when we noticed the man standing on the other side of the water. At first, we were startled, throwing our cans back into my backpack and getting ready to run as we thought we were going to get caught. However, the man just stood there. For a while, I stood there watching him as he stared lifelessly at us. It was pretty unnerving. The guy had to be about 40 years old with gray hair, but he was standing so abnormally. His legs parted evenly, and his arms parted from his body to his sides. He didn't move, he just stared. I looked at my friend, who I'll call Josh in this story, and he looked back at me. By the looks, unnerved. He decided to shout out, Hey! at the man. And then, You alright, buddy? At first, I thought this was a bad idea, but I just let it happen to see the man's reaction. Nothing. He just stood there like a mannequin. We were getting pretty shaken up, but we just had to walk further along the canal and continue painting. About an hour later, we pretty much have forgotten about the whole thing. We were now down our last two cans of paint, so we was about to call it a day. When I stepped back to see what we created, then I noticed the same man from before, standing in the middle of the dirty canals, just staring lifelessly at us. I was so surprised to see him that I dropped my can into the canal 
and turned to face Josh. He noticed the man too. The man took the first step we seen him take all day. Towards us. We dropped the cans and sprinted across the path back to the ladder. We pretty much ran all the way back to the city center. Where we catch our breath and try to figure out what the hell just happened. And what we experienced. Thank you so much for reading my story. What do you guys think happened to that man? Why was he just staring at us? I guess we'll never find out. So last Friday, I, 25 female, had a little time to kill before picking up my kids from school. And it was a gorgeous day, so I decided to spend some time cruising around some back roads in my small town, a small rural area, listening to music. I pass this guy with sticking his I pass this guy with his thumb sticking out, trying to catch a ride, and I almost picked up this guy. He looked to be about his late thirties, early forties, carrying a fishing pole in his backpack. Pretty innocent looking, I guess. But see, I'm a lone female, and have been taught with hundreds of hitchhikers gone wrong stories that you just keep driving. So, I kept driving. And as I'm driving, I'm having this internal dialogue of guilt about my decision on not picking up this guy. You know, if I was hitchhiking, if I was hitchhiking, I hope someone will pick me up. And I mean, really, what's the worst that could happen? That mixed with my new self-improvement goal of doing the things that scare me as often as possible. Led me to the conclusion that if, when I loop back around and he was still walking, I would pick him up. Sure enough, about 10 minutes later, he was still there. I was feeling a little bit nervous pulling over to get him, but what was I going to do? Peeling out while he was trying to get in my vehicle, as soon as he gets in, I realize I probably made the worst and horrible mistake. One, because he seemed like he was tweaking balls and smelled god-awful. Two, because this dude was looking at me like I was a feast and he was starving. I didn't realize how exactly rattled I was with my decision until he asked me for a smoke and my hands were shaking so bad I barely pulled out one of my pack without breaking it. Driving made it easier to hide my nerves but I was internally freaking out and deciding how I would beat this guy's ass if he tried to do anything. His name is Wayne he lives about five minutes from where I picked him up. Meanwhile, he's telling me how he lost his license due to DUIs. And how he is living at his house with an old man. He tried to get him to come with him, but he didn't want to come. He's also trying to talk me into hanging out with his said house. With him and come over and drink with him the next day. When I finally get him to his destination, it's a little shack like thing. Surrounded by all these junk cars and crap. He gets out and is trying to still get me to come inside with him. I tell him no. And left. I'm feeling really relieved and a little proud of that that I faced my fear. Fast forward to Monday. My instructor said, Holy crap. Apparently someone got murdered down that so and such road. Do you know anyone down that way? I said, Wow. You know... That's really ironic. I took a hitchhiker down that road this Friday. His name was Wayne, I think. Probably wasn't 15 minutes later when I saw old Wayne's picture on Facebook saying the TBI has picked him up for stabbing someone to death at the very place that I dropped him off that Friday. Graphic information of how he impaled someone in the chest and the victim just didn't make it inside the little shack. And the old man he was living with doesn't even exist. I swear, I'll never pick up another hitchhiker again in my life. A 
Although it doesn't seem like it, this happened quite a while back. Probably over 10 years ago. I was in the later years of high school and was home alone. My parents were at a wedding that required them to stay at a hotel and my brother worked a night shift. At the time, my family lived in a very well-known East Coast city in a blue-collar neighborhood that was starting to take a nosedive. As a teenager, I was a bit of a loner. Wasn't a nerd or anything. I was a big dude who had friends and went on dates, but I'm a natural introvert. So I cherished the rare alone times that I got. This weekend, I was looking forward to engage in my normal empty house routine. Play some PlayStation on the big TV screen, then order a late takeout, pizza or Chinese, and pick out while watching some Dragon Ball Z. Then around 2 a.m., fall asleep on the couch with my old dog, Cecil. Cecil was a beagle who was old as the hills. and had been in our family for about eight years. He was quiet and peaceful and spent his time begging for food and sleeping. Unlike most beagles, Cecil never howled or barked. He was more than content to rest his head on your lap and spend the night there. Anyway, back to the story. It's approximately one in the morning. I had just finished the last slice of pizza and was just dozing off on the couch when I heard a bang coming from the back alleyway. I didn't think much of it. Anyone that has lived in the city knows noise happen all the time at night. Cecil's head pop off on my lap and the hair on the back of my neck stood up. He's always been a bit skittish, so I calmed him down and started dozing off again. Not more than two minutes later, I hear another bang, and Cecil did something I've never seen him do. He lipped off the couch and ran like the wind towards the door, leading to the basement, barking and growling like a, a dog twice his size. The look on his face reminded me of a German Shepherd canine unit. I've never seen him like that before, which got my adrenaline pumping. Through the dog's barking, I now make out a persistent banging. There was a seldom used door in the basement that led to our back alleyway. It was old and rusted and was hard to open, even with a key, and it made a lot of noise. I suddenly realized that someone was trying to break into my house through the basement door. Quick little bit of context. For anyone that who hasn't lived in a bad neighborhood, if someone tries to get in your house and moves on after they realize the door is locked, they want your stuff. If someone is persistently trying to get into your house, despite the door being locked and the dog barking, well, they want you. Knowing this, I rushed upstairs to grab the heavy wooden baseball bat that I kept under my bed for this very situation. Then I head down to my basement. I probably should have ran, but I was a macho teenager with a tough guy complex. And plus, I had nowhere to go. While heading down to the basement, Cecil blows past me with the speed and aggression of a dog half his age. Suddenly, I hear a man's voice say, Oh crap! And the banging stopped. I didn't call the cops or anyone else, which was probably the dumbest thing I've ever done. I just sat up for the rest of the night with a baseball bat in my hand. My brother came home that morning, and I told him what happened. We went to the basement door to take a look, and when we gave it a tug to open it, the whole door fell off. This psycho was going to give one last good shove from getting into my house. But old Cecil scared him off. I'm pretty sure that lazy fat old dog saved my life. When I tell the story to people, they dismiss his action as a dog doing what a dog's supposed to do. But when I tell you that Cecil never barked or moved that fast in his life, you can take that to the bank. It was like almost like he knew the urgency. Like he knew the door was going to give in. A few years back, we had to put him down because he just lost his will to live. Before the injection, I got a moment alone with him. I thanked him one last time for his friendship and for what he did that night. At this point, I was a grown man with a wife and kids. I'm convinced none of this would happen without old Cecil. He's my hero. Thanks, pal. I miss you.
I'm a girl, and this happened when I was 20 in the early 2000s. People used landlines and cell phones were not unlimited. This happened in a town about an hour away from Sacramento. My friend was house-sitting for a family that her family was friends with from church. She was but the house-sit in the country, just outside of town for a week. They had animals like cats, rabbits, a donkey, and horse. The family also had dogs too, but the family took the dogs with them. My friend was in charge of feeding the animals and watching the place. She did not have to get the mail daily because they had this metal lockbox style mailbox down their long driveway. They didn't have any neighbors for miles, just fields of alfalfa, cattle, and corn. So I guess the lockbox was for safety. Towards the end of the week, she asked if I wanted to spend a night and keep her company, and I thought it sounded fun. I had moved out of my aunts and uncles and got my own apartment. So I told her I'd pick her up on my way there after I got off work. We got there around 9.30 p.m., grabbing dinner on the way. We went into the barn first thing and fed the animals. It was late for their dinner, and, and they made their hunger known with their animal noises. We made sure they had water, then went inside. The house was a big, ranch-style house. Single story. The living room was to the left as you walk into the home. There was a long hallway directly to the right of the entrance that led to where the bathroom and bedrooms were. Straight ahead was the dining area, and to the left of that was the kitchen entrance and a patio. They did not have an open floor plan. In the kitchen, on the opposite side was a long hallway that had several doors. My friend explained that the wife ran a daycare center out of the house. These rooms were play areas for the kids that she took care of. We didn't bother going over there because we had no interest. We watched some TV, ate our leftovers, and talked about people that we knew. As it got later, she turned on the house alarm, and she didn't like sleeping in other people's beds, so she had been sleeping on the couch, then offered it to me. She would sleep on one of the two large recliners, that reclined so far back that it was almost flat. The chairs were really comfortable, so I just made it like a chair. I went and laid on the chair with my blanket. We turned off the TV, and we were talking for maybe 20 minutes in the dark when the motion sensor floodlights started shining through the window, lighting the room up. Now, I really have no idea why people in the country think it's okay to not have curtains or blinds, because to me, that's insane. We both got quiet, and Amanda says, maybe it was one of those cats? Then we start hearing gravel crunch, like a person walking across gravel in a parking lot outside. My chair was closest to the window, and I slid carefully down to the floor, clutching the stupid blanket the whole time. The floodlights timed out. My friend slid to the floor. We laid on our stomach in the dark, not knowing what to do for a minute, when we heard a loud bang, and all of a sudden the house alarm started blaring, and the floodlights turned on again. It was so loud, we covered our ears and I started to panic. I swear, I have never been so close to peeing my pants in my life. I began crawling towards the keypad for the security because I've seen the commercials. There's a button you push and a person responds to you in case of an emergency, or at least sends the police. The main screen says, patio, one of two, open. Amanda starts to cry a little and hits the call assistant button on the pad and nothing happens. There's no assistance. I asked her what the phone is and she said there's a phone in the kitchen in one of the parents room down the hall. So our choices are to go to the kitchen past the windows and next to one of the patio doors 
or go down the hall to the parents' room and use the phone there. I asked her where the other patio is, and she said it was in the daycare part of the house. It was an easy decision. We go inside the parents' room, and it's pitch black. I asked her where the phone is, and she says, I think we have to turn the light on. I don't want to turn the light on, but I have no choice. I don't have a flashlight, and I didn't bring my cell because I had limited minutes. It was a simpler time, and Amanda didn't even get her own cell until after this happened. She turns on the light, and we started looking around the room. Not only did these people not have any curtains on any window, but they didn't even have any closet doors. We see a golf club hitting against the wall by the bed. They probably have it instead of a baseball bat, which is what I had next to my bed at home. We figure if we hit someone with it, it's going to leave a mark. She grabs it and we continue our search for a phone. Looking at the obvious places, we find a cordless phone stand, minus the actual phone. The alarm is still raging. We have a light on, and the person who opened the patio door is bound to notice is all I'm thinking at this point. She asks, should we use the locate phone buttons? I look at her and respond, yeah, if you want some strange guy coming in here and asking us if we were looking for something. I'm getting mad that I'm scared in this situation. Standing there, knowing that we have to go in the kitchen, the house alarm stops. It gets country quiet. If you live in the country, you know what I'm talking about. There isn't another golf club for me to grab. So I make her go out first, flipping every light on and keeping the door we passed in the closet. So I make her go out first. Flipping every light on and keeping the door we pass in the hall closed. We double check the security panel and it still says patio open. I hit call button and it still doesn't work. Double checking the front door is locked. We start for the kitchen. I tell her we have to check the patio near the kitchen and I grab a big knife. It wasn't even close to being sharp from the kitchen. We check the patio door near the kitchen and it's locked. We turn on the lights and grab the phone and dial 911. The phone isn't a cordless phone. It's one of those ones with a cord attached to a wall. My friend is on the phone with dispatch telling her what happened and I hear a whistle coming from outside of the kitchen window. The thing people don't think about, because I didn't in my thinking about safety was turn on the lights, is while you have a reflection of the inside of the window, people on the outside have a clear view of you. Instead of you pressing your face against the window, I hear the whistle again. The sound like someone was trying to get someone else's attention kind of whistle. But I don't see anything outside. I'm about to press my face to the window to see if I'm the person they're whistling for. My friend is still talking to the dispatcher and is crying and saying that she doesn't have the address to the house. She hands me the phone and I say, Hello? The dispatcher lady, who sounds annoyed, tells me that she needs the address to send the police to. I ask that she trace the phone call, and she says something like, You're house sitting, and you don't even know where you're at? Scared, angry, and overwhelmed? I hand the phone back to Amanda, and start looking for something with an address in the kitchen. I'm looking for the junk drawer, on the counter, on the refrigerator, fully keeping an eye down in the hall that has a daycare room. Knowing that on the other side of one of these doors is a patio that was open. Amanda tells the dispatcher that she doesn't pick up their mail because of their mailbox. And then, a few seconds later, removes the phone from her ear and stares at me with a blank face. I asked her if they're tracing the call because I cannot find anything with an address. Amanda says low. I hope the police finds you in time. And she hung up on the phone. I was so scared and angry at the same time. We knew that there were people outside. We knew that the patio door to the daycare area was open. We did not know what to do. We stood in the kitchen silent for what seemed like forever. That was probably one minute. I pick up the phone and dialed 411. I told Amanda that they would have a number to the police department. As calmly as I could, I explained what was happening to us. I included the 911 dispatcher and said we really 
need the phone number of the police department. That's when we heard a huge metal bang outside of the kitchen window by the patio door. It sounded like someone dropped something metal and heavy. Amanda started crying and I couldn't hold in my fear anymore and started crying too. Whoever was outside was going to break open the patio door. That's what I'm thinking. The 411 operator said that they were connecting us. It would stay in the line with us after getting pissed at the 911 dispatcher on our behalf. A police officer answered the phone and the 411 operator started explaining what's happening to the police. Then they were asked to disconnect once we established a connection. The police asked a few questions and we heard the whistling outside again and the floodlights all around the house turned on again. I was too scared to look outside and we never turned on the patio light because we had to walk across the patio window to get the switch. We told the policeman on the phone about the whistle and he said that there should be several policemen showing up shortly and to stay on the phone. We were outside the town limits and knew that it might take a few minutes. Having a police officer on the phone made me feel a little bit better, but I was still really scared. He told us that the police arrived and we were coming up the drive. The policeman said to put down the phone and open the front door. And so I did. What I saw was a police pickup truck with spotlights flashing into the pastures. They ran along the sides of the driveway. Two officers, not with handguns, but with shotguns, walking slowly beside the truck as I came up the long driveway. Four officers approached the house, asking us our names. One went to the phone and said that they were here and they hung up on the phone. They ordered us to stay in the dining room and began searching the house. One by one, they returned. Last one came back through the patio door by the kitchen. He said he searched a barn and the horses scared him. And the horse also looked spooked. He asked what other animals were in the barn. They told us that they didn't find anyone and that the daycare patio was not locked. There was, however, a broom handle in the track to prevent it from being opened too far. I look at the patio door that the officer entered in and saw that there was not a broom handle in that one, then felt dumb because he just walked through it. They lectured Amanda about not knowing the address of the house that she was supposed to be responsible for and other stuff that I don't remember. After finishing statements, they said that they stick around and look more. And if we wanted to leave, we could. They could lock the bottom lock, but not activate the alarm. And we were cool with that. We were out there so fast. We got into my car and went to her mom's. We were so mentally exhausted. We fell asleep. I went to my office job the next morning. She said that she really did not want to go back to the house, but she said she had to feed the animals for their breakfast. Her mom told her to take her sisters, and she did. That afternoon, she called me at work. She was really nervous and began telling me that they went to the house and there were footprints and poop in the carpet. I said it was probably that cop that checked the barn and she said that she didn't know or paid attention. Also, she said that when she went to the barn to feed and water the animals in the morning, someone had tied all the rabbit legs together in their hutches. They had 10 rabbits the kids used for 4-H. Amanda then continued to say that there was a note with the word Lucky scribble on the back of the pizza coupon. She thought it came from the refrigerator door because the flyer was missing a coupon. It took a while for them to untie the rabbit's legs and Amanda asked her mom to find someone else from their church to finish the house sitting. She wasn't going to go back. She also told the officer what she came back to but no one was ever caught and the police never called either to any of us to give us an update. What a crazy night. I was about 11 when this happened. My older cousin Daniel 
He was about 13. And now we're playing hide and seek outside my grandma's yard. She owned a large farm in Tennessee, just over a thousand acres. And I grew up my entire life there. And so did Daniel. So it did nothing for us to wander off and play in the areas that we were not supposed to. But we knew the property like the back of our hand. It just so happened that the day before this happened, a lot of trees were cut down to make room for new mobile homes just by down the road. This way, my aunt intends on renting out with some extra income. Daniel and I naturally gravitate towards the new familiar landscape to play because it was something new to explore. All of the trees have been stripped down to the branches and placed in logging trucks and hauled off. The branches, however, were all piled up in tangled mess about 50 feet wide and 12 feet tall. They were packed so densely that you couldn't see them from the other side. It was about half an hour mark when it was my turn to find Daniel that I began to suspect that he was hiding in the woods deeper than our stated rules allowed. I remember calling his name for several minutes and hearing nothing but a quiet giggle coming from the woods. I was in the newly cut clearing looking into the woods and getting more upset by the minute. Finally, I announced as loudly as I could that if he wasn't going to play fairly, then I was going to go in and get a glass of tea and watch television with grandma. I started back up the hill towards the house. It was at that moment that I walked past the brush pile, basically centered beside it, that I heard an unfamiliar voice you gave up quickly. I stopped and called out, Daniel? It didn't sound like Daniel, but the voice responded, Yes, I'm Daniel. I'm inside of the limbs. I looked at the brush pile and didn't see anyone. Again, I heard the odd voice call out, If you do not see me, then you have not found me, and I will have won the game. I stepped closer and yelled out to the voice, Why are you talking so funny? The voice replied, I am inside all of the limbs. Look inside and you'll see me, Daniel. Something felt strange about the way this guy was talking, but 11-year-old me just rationalized it by thinking, maybe his voice sounds different because the shrubbery and he sounds like he's talking funny because his voice sounds different. I stepped up to the edge of the brush pile and pulled the branches apart to look inside. And there was Daniel. His head was turning upward on top of the hill, but his body was facing me. I yelled out, I caught you. His head shifted towards me. He had the single most disgusting smile I've ever seen to this day. Imagine if someone had the absolute worst of intentions and they were trying to hide behind a fake, innocent smile to gain your trust. But they couldn't help their glee with the thought that they may have fooled you. That's the best way I can describe that smile. I was so shocked by this wicked facial expression on my cousin's face that I froze in place, the hairs on my neck and arms all raised. I could feel my blood running through my body like the temperature had dropped inside my veins. I stammered through my words. Uh, how, how did you get in there? He responded. I fell into the inside of the limbs, cousin. I would need you to help me. Or I would continue to be trapped. I didn't notice this time how oddly he phrased his sentences. And it only occurred to me afterwards that his lips were not moving when he spoke. He never changed his face from the twisted, unnerving smile as well. I didn't immediately notice any of these things because I was too distracted by the large stick that was plunging deeply into the side of his neck. I noticed in the moment that he had slowly, steadily trickled stream of blood flowing from a half dollar sized stick into his neck and down across the right of his shoulder and down his chest. That was enough for me to jolt my feet awake before my brain realized that I was trying to run. I was already halfway up the hill to my grandma's house. When I bursted through the door to my grandma's living room, Daniel was curled up into a ball on the couch and crying hysterically. 
My grandmother was sitting beside him trying our best to get him to explain what was wrong. And all he said that there was this little boy in the woods who tagged him when he was hiding. And he thought it wasn't really me. He wouldn't say anything else. I was crying and shaken up by this point and told my grandmother what I've seen. She made us both some lunch and then called my uncle to come pick up Daniel. I stayed at my grandmother's house that night. I bet she asked me what happened about a hundred times. She asked so many questions. It was as if she was committing to a memory. I remember being relieved that she believed me. But at the same time, I wanted her to tell me that it was all in my imagination and to help me forget about it. The next day, my grandmother set the bush pile on fire. I watched it for hours from the safety of the living room window. As it slowly disoriented into a pile of ash and ember, my cousin never did tell me what really happened to him that day. He refuses to talk about it. I will say this though, he wouldn't talk to me for a year and a half after that day. We were so close when we were little, but that event, whatever the hell it was, it drove a wedge between us after that and changed our relationship forever.